Sean McGibney, I am putting together a analysis I undertook of the Donfresh South Butte Controlled Activities Regulations consultation, which is available through the SEPA website. The reference number for this uh, consultation is NS11675336. Okay, so what I'm going to be covering in the next while, whilst I go through this analysis, is as follows. Kokatan Bay and South Butte, a bit about the environment and uh, a bit of context with regards to the proposed application. Two, uh, Donfish Farming Limited, a bit about the company themselves. Number three, Donfish South Butte application focusing specifically on specific parts of the application, namely Form A, an investigation into the main pollutants. Form C, farm discharge and use of chemicals. Hydrographic survey, the dispersion modelling, bath medicine or treatments modelling. These are all constituent components of the application package. And then I'll, I suppose, conclude or summarise. So starting with Kokatan Bay and South Butte, um, the application itself uh, concerns uh, the Donfresh, Donfresh Farming Limited's uh, proposed site at the south of Butte. Um, this is just south of the small village of Kokatan Bay in the south of the island. And one of the things which really characterises uh, this geolocal is uh, the prevailing westerly wind. And this is very important within the context of this application because wind is a primary variable, geophysical variable, which influences the dispersal of uh, particulates, particularly within marine environments. And uh, tide and wind and currents are all intrinsically linked and that's very important within the context of this application. And if we look at the word prevailing itself, it states here having the most appeal or influence. And this westerly wind is extremely um, prevalent uh, within this geolocal. This is important because according to um, United States government's National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, otherwise known as NOAA. Um, one of the primary factors, a secondary factor that drives ocean currents is wind. And if we're thinking about a proposed fish farm with 10 pods, um, wind, which is totally prevalent at the site, is known to drive ocean currents and hence accelerate or drive the dispersal of particulates and foreign material which is a, a byproduct of farming activities, marine farming activities, in particular here rainbow trout farming activities. So you can see here, this is taken from the application package, we are just north of Whiteport, Kokatan Bay, situated slightly northwest of the proposed site. The proposed site is um, to be situated uh, immediately east or ad adjacent to the Hawks Nib and locals or people that have been to the south, the south of the island of Butte will know the Hawks Nib is a pretty famous landmark um, slightly further north of the uh, Glen Callum Bay and the lighthouse at the very south of the island or pretty close to the south of the island. Just to give a, maybe a, a bit more of a recognisable view, we've got Kokatan Bay here, the, with, situated in the Firth of Clyde, and the proposed site is around about where my marker is just now, around about here. Um, it's, it's probably uh, appropriate to say as well that this whole trail, there's a trail that comes down here called the West Island Way, that would that would run past that this proposed site, so it'd be very uh, 
it would be seen a lot by you know anybody that's that's down there. Um, it wouldn't be hidden; it would be very much in the public eye and very close to the shoreline as well. So, moving onwards here, I managed to find an aerial view of the south of the island. At the very bottom here, you can see uh, the Glencallum Bay and the lighthouse, and further up the coast, closer to further north and northwest, we can see, um, in particular, where round about here is where the Hawks Nib is. So we're east, the proposed site would be somewhere round about here. But what's really important about this picture, if I zoom in, is you can see the, t the vary variability, or the tidal variability here, is significant, really significant. And that there in itself, is extremely important within the context of this application because with such a variability in tide, the dispersal of foreign matter, the currents which go with highs and low tides mean that uh, it's, it's common sense that particulates will ultimately disperse uh, on a much more varied scale than they otherwise would in more stable uh, marine environments, especially coastal marine environments. I thought that that was quite insightful to just see from the bird's eye view the the tidal line here. Quite interesting. So some of you may be wondering, if we go back to the very beginning, what, what a car actually is. You'll see this on the marine, in the SEPA website associated with the, the application. Car is essentially just controlled activities regulations. The controlled activities regulations and in particular the Water Environment Controlled Activities Scotland regulations are Scottish statutory instruments introduced in 2011 and uh, are amended, I think, up until 2011. Uh, so if anybody's wondering what CAR is, it's Controlled Activities Regulations. It's regulatory, regulatory compliance, essentially, in order to enforce um, other types of legislation. So that's part one. Part two here is about Don Fresh Farming Limited. So uh, Don Fresh Farm Limited, in order to get a bit of information about them, I decided to go over to Company's House, as anybody can do, if you want to figure out or find out information about companies and what their, uh, essentially their filings look like. So anybody can go here. I will include all the hyperlinks. Don Fresh, uh, Don Fresh Farm Limited, Company SC 344049 are, are up to speed with all their filings. Uh, I've had a look at uh, their full accounts uh, up until 29th of March 2020. Uh, and in looking at some of their accounts, uh, I came across, this is their full, full account for the period ended 29th of March 2020. Um, I had a look at some of the directors and it's, it's quite interesting when you do some digging here. One of the directors is uh, Alistair Eric Hodson Salveson, CBE, a British billionaire businessman and heir, uh, whose distant ancestors uh, founded uh, whaling and shipping companies, so essentially exploiting um, mammals for financial gain. And uh, that I, th I find that quite ironic that... Um, the basking shark, commonly mistaken for maybe a whale, is you know a lot of people are looking forward to a more frequent return, periodic return of the basking shark to the island of Butte. Um, whilst at the same time we're we're looking at uh, an application, which could potentially um, damage the the marine environment. So anyway, going back to the um, Dillon Fresh Farm Limited. Uh, accounts here, statements. Um, I'm interested in looking at page four immediately. And this is quite insightful, I think. So fair review of business on page four out of 29 for the strategic report for the period ended 29th of March 2020. Uh, you can read along with me here. During 2019-2020, Donfresh Farming continued its focus in large Scottish loch trout with a 13% increase in harvest volumes. Okay, and what I think when I say that is, how do you increase by thirteen percent in one year? That seems quite a an increase. 
and input volumes of our juvenile sites increasing to facilitate a further 20% increase in harvest tonnage next year. That's what they're looking to do. That seems extremely ambitious to me, but, you know, that's all fine. The second paragraph here is, is particularly interesting. Key successes for Donfresh farming have continued, have been continued high levels of fish health. And fish health here is a, mm, a very interesting uh, concept. But it goes on to say, in particular, sea lice control. Okay, so the the assertion here is that less sea lice per fish means that the fish is healthy. And I think uh, you could many biologists would potentially argue that that's not a, a reasonable indicator of fish health is the amount of sea lice on the fish um, in our, but anyway particular sea lice control and you think well how do you control sea lice in a pen okay this is going to be a real uh, important theme of this analysis is how do you control sea lice in a fish farming operation okay um, they're, they're using words like um, while harvest output has been further optimised okay they're using words like optimised which are Pretty, pretty uh, um, positive words, quite extreme words maybe. Optimised is, is a quite a, a powerful word to be using here, particularly when we're talking about sea lice control. Anyway, that, I just wanted to have a look at some of these things um, to make people aware of, of what's going on. Another interesting page here was page 27. So if I scroll down to page 27... Um, for others that are interested in having a look at the, the accounts, um, in 2020, I believe, the company made a loss of some £2 million. But what's quite interesting about Don Fresh Farming Limited is that the period ending 29th of March 2020, um, uh, the limited uh, organisation took uh, £198,111 um, from a government grant, nearly two hundred thousand pounds in a grant for the year twenty twenty, and not far off that in twenty nineteen. It'd be interesting to see. I've not done the research right now, but it'd be interesting to see if you know uh, Don Fresh Farming Limited consistently has been um, being awarded grants of up above one hundred and fifty thousand pounds. It's uh, quite a significant figure, um, considering. Uh, current conditions really with all of the public funding issues that were that we seem to be having so that's all i wanted to really cover from from dawn fresh um, and basically move on really to the application so let's go ahead and do that so what i'm going to cover here is the application is split down into a number of constituent constituents application form a c the site plan which we've already seen a hydrographic survey, dispersion, dispersion modelling um, research report for use of better terminology, a biomass modelling report and a bathing medicine report. Uh, this bathing medicine is uh, interesting terminology um, because uh, it's, it's either referred to as medicine or, or treatment really, treatment. They call it medicine but uh, medicine indicates that the, the, the fish is sick uh, because if you're sick you need medicine to get better and the reports maybe synonymously interchange the use of the word medicine with treatment. Um, it's quite interesting the, the use of terminology depending on who the reports are coming from, who the research activity is coming from. So anyway, we move, we move on. Let's have a look at Form A. So in Form A... Um, Basically, what I'm going to do is, is talk you through the non-technical summary, which is on page number six. And anybody can access these, access these documents. I'll keep all the links down in the video description. So the non-technical summary here is Don Fresh Farming Limited is applying for permission for a new car. Remember, we covered car before. Regulatory license to operate a new marine rainbow trout farm in the waters of the island of the Butte, the South Island of the Butte. Paragraph two. The new license will enable the company to operate um, 10 by 120 meter circumference pens, a maximum biomass. The application also seeks permission to use 
bath treatments, okay? They're, they're calling it treatments here, and they're calling it uh, medicine here. Okay, so it's just, if you see those terminology uh, discrepancies, that's what it is. But the, the, the bathing treatments, or the bathing treatments here, uh, got me interested. Cypermethrin, cypermethrin, deltamethrin, and azamethifos, or azamethifos, I believe it's pronounced. So taking a look at these, um, that's where I started off my analysis, okay? Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and do that, okay? And what we where I started was basically an investigation into the main chemical pollutants: cypermethrin, deltamethrin, and azimethyphos. So heading over to the Water Environment Controlled Activity Scotland Regulations, twenty twenty eleven. And I started reading a bit about um, whether or not the statutory instrument. Um, defines what's permiss permitted and what's not from this chemical standpoint, from this bathing standpoint. And I was able to describe that at the uh, foot or ske schedule schedules associated with this statutory instrument, we've got sch schedule one, which is an indicative list of main pollutants. And if you click on the indicative list of main pollutants in schedule one, what you'll see is that um, there are a list here not specifically the uh, pollutants themselves, but certainly guidance on um, the, the, the types of categories, maybe, is, is how I would maybe better describe it. So where I ended up here was number four, and I'm highlighting number four for a specific reason. Substances and preparations or the breakdown products of such which have been proved to possess carcinogenic or mutagenic properties, or properties which may affect steroidogenic thyroid reproduction or endocrine related functions or via the aquatic environment. Okay, particular carcinogens. That just got me very interested here to see whether there was more that we could dig out of this. So I headed over to uh, a very well used resource, PubChem. Uh, PubChem is uh, maintained, it's an open chemistry database maintained by the National Institutes of Health. Uh, and since its launch in 2004, PubChem has become a key chemical information resource for scientists, students and the general public, very, very heavily, pervasively used throughout the science, the science scientific community. And what PubChem en enables you to do is pick individual compounds or chemicals chemical compounds and learn about them, okay? So it gives you structures, okay? Um, synonyms, different ways, chemical formula, molecular formulas, etc., etc., etc. One of the things that I ended up doing, and, and remember, cypermethrin is one of the chemical compounds which is being included within the non-technical summary. Cypermethrin, deltamethrin, and azamethifos, okay? So heading back over to PubMed, PubChem, sorry, you can see that uh, if we go to safety standards here, section content, Taylor contents, safety standards 13, we go down in safety standards, uh, the safety st ha and safety and hazards, apologies, 13.1.1 GHS, GHS classifications. What is GHS classification? GHS is the globally harmonized system of classification and labeling of chemicals. Is a United Nations system to identify hazardous chemicals and to inform users about these hazards. And if you look at these hazard statements associated with cypermethrin, it's harmful if swallowed, it's harmful if inhaled, may cause respiratory irritation, very toxic to aquatic life, very toxic to aquatic life and long with long lasting effects. Okay? This is extremely concerning within the context of the South Butte application. Okay. So, um, there's more to this though. So let's keep going down. If we get down to uh, section 14 of the table of contents, and go to toxicity. You see within toxicity, we have evidence of carcinogenicity. 
and cypermethrin, according to PubChem, is classified as a Group C possible human carcinogen. Okay, this is the chemical compound with which the rainbow trout will be bathed in to prevent sea lice from occurring. So undoubtedly, and without any reservation, these fish will be ingesting cypermethrin. There's no doubt about it. They breathe it in through their gills when they're being bathed, and it's in their bodies. This raises serious questions as to when these fish are culled, harvested, and then essentially made ready for human consumption. It's extremely, extremely concerning that this type of chemical compound would be used in the sea off the south of Butte uh, in the proposed application. Extremely concerning. Delta methane's next, and it doesn't get much better. So I didn't need to look very far. I went onto Wikipedia to look for delta methane, and in paragraph two, delta methane is toxic to aquatic life, particularly fish. So for this bathing or the uh, treatment activity, which is undertaken as part of the farming, delta methane is also used, and it's there in public view on wikipedia.org, that it's toxic to aquatic life, particularly fish, okay? Heading over to PubChem, the same as we did for the previous chemical compound, I'm here down at the GHS classification for delta methane. It's toxic if swallowed, toxic if inhaled, very toxic to aquatic life, very toxic to aquatic life with long-lasting effects. Hazard to aquatic environment, it's a long-term hazard to the aquatic environment. Okay, very concerning. Azimethifos, the final one which has been, the final chemical compound which is listed in the um, bathing or treatment uh, within the, the technical summary in, in uh, form A. Very toxic to aquatic life. There's a bit of an emerging theme here. Very toxic to aquatic life with long-lasting effects. It's just, it just doesn't, doesn't look particularly good. I was interested in delta methane safety hazards. I wonder if there are any toxicity, evidence of carcinogenicity. Uh, delta methane, not likely to be carcinogenic to humans. Okay. So moving on, I thought I would have a look at some uh, research literature or scientific literature regarding the use of some of these chemical compounds. I was very easily able to come across a publication from 2004 within Elsevier's Journal of uh, Ecotoxicology and Environmental Safety titled Effects of Cypermethrine on Marine Plankton Communities, a simulated field study using mesocosms. Uh, essentially, the authors here uh, stated that the pesticide immediately reduced zooplankton density, zooplankton being one of the critical um, constituents of marine habitat, marine biodiversity. Uh, the pesticide immediately reduced zoo zooplankton density and biodiversity not only directly by killing co cope pods, but also indirectly by increasing the number of rotifers. Zooplankton density recovered after treatment, but zooplankton biodiversity remained altered. So what, what these authors are essentially saying here in their abstract is that cypermethrin can affect zooplankton biodiversity to the degree that it remains altered even after treatment, okay? Zooplankton, of course, being some of the, I would imagine, microscopic constituents which... Um, Ma the, the, the ecosystem relies upon one of the foundation is probably the foundation of the eco the marine ecosystem uh, which would be the part you could imagine of a, a basking sharks diet and uh, what we're trying to do here is encourage basking sharks back to the island but at the same time saying that we're going to be dumping for use of a better term 
harmful aquatic toxic chemical compounds into the sea off the south coast of, of the island. It's n not really matching up too well here. So just to remind you, going back here, the Water Environment Controlled Activities Scotland Regulation of 2011, Scottish Statutory Instrument, and let's go over this. Schedule 1, item number 4 again. Substances and preparations of the breakdown products of such which have been proved to possess carcinogenic or mutagenic properties. It's extremely, extremely concerning that this is listed. These carcinogens are listed within the Scottish Statutory Instruments, but at the same time, there's nothing uh, highlighted within the application relating to this. It seems slightly one-sided. Moving on, let's have a look at uh, Form C within the application. So within Form C, uh, there's a couple of pages which I think are important, particularly page 4. Page 4 essentially shows the biomass profile. Uh, this graph on the x-axis, the bottom axis here, is the months of production running from one month through to 23. Um, the proposal here, I believe, is for 22 and a half months of um, production with a six-week grace period. So essentially, these uh, all the feed and the feces, the fecal matter, and the dead fish and the harvesting goes on for t over 20-odd months. And then it's expected that the marine environment will be given six weeks to completely recover. And then this process starts from scratch again. This is what has been proposed um, by Don Fish Farming Limited. I thought that was quite interesting. It doesn't sound like a particularly long time for uh, the recovery of the marine environment. That's on page four. Page five. You can see that uh, what they've outlined here is that there'll be, um, you know, between five and almost uh, seven point two percent nitrogen in the fish food, and phosphorus will be one to one point five percent. And I just wonder what kind of studies have been done, whether uh, marine to marine uh, wildlife, if they ingest uh, food of of these types of chemical concentrations uh, or, or these types of concentrations. I think that would be extremely um, interesting to try and figure out. Uh, another thing here is that the, it, it states that please list all chemicals, medicines that you intend to use on the farm. Um, the, there are a number of questions which are asked here okay, in the following details. Um, the total quantity of neat chemical used for each application of the amount of the active ingredient. Okay. Um, the number of applications typically needed. This one in particular, the total quantity of neat chemical used for each application. The total quantity, so that's something very specific. And uh, I'll go on to show how that, that doesn't really ever come out. But the response here is full chemical list is included in the applications folder. So there's not really been an attempt to to answer that question. Uh, very interesting as well, on page fact six of nine, um, that the uh, mi minimizing the release of polluting matter, 3.6, how do you intend to minimize the, 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 the deposition of food, fish, feces underneath the cages? Fish will be fed in accordance with feed guides and based on feed uptake. Feed uptake will be kept under constant surveillance using the latest camera technology to optimise feed use and minimise waste. None of that answers the question, which is how do you intend to minimise the deposition of food, fish, faeces under the cages? It just said that fish will be fed. It doesn't say how they intend to minimise faeces underneath the cages. Okay, It just says that they'll monitor it with, with uh, surveillance cameras but it doesn't say how they would minimise. Okay, I think it's just interesting. There's not a lot of details here in these answers. I thought I would have expected them to be. And this is the only place that any cameras are mentioned in the entire application here. Okay, moving onwards. Let's have a look at the hydrographic survey. So the hydrographic survey, uh, in particular, I'm going to skip over to page number three. 
Um, really, <laughs> this is quite interesting. Uh, all, deploy, all deployed ADCPs, and these are Dopplers, essentially uh, sensors which are deployed into the sea, which were deployed into the sea, and which um, obtained data, acquired data, uh, which is then used within the basis, or to form the basis of this hydrographic survey. And if you look at the, uh, the geo coordinates here, uh, which I've highlighted, 5-5, five, five, right the way through to the W. Uh, these coordinates actually end up uh, off the east coast of Great Cumbria. They're not, they bear no resemblance to coordinates of the southwest of the island of Butte. And please go and check this out. They bear absolutely no resemblance. So... This raises serious questions for me. I, I'm not sure why the Houses of Parliament and Big Ben are in the background here with us. But believe me, go ahead, type this in. This resolves, coordinate, coordinates resolve to the east coast of, of Great Cumbria. They do not resolve to Coquantan Bay. Eh, sorry, to the south of Butte. That's the first discrepancy I found in this report. And really, um, I... That, that raises serious questions about the technical competency of those that provided this report. It's as simple as that. Um, if you're referencing that the, the 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 instruments which you deployed were deployed at the wrong location, then why is this included in a in a, in a hydrographic survey in response to an application? Uh, it doesn't make any sense. The next part that I wanted to cover here was uh, uh, page 11. Scroll down to page 11. You can see here that they are talking about, uh, the report covers here um, weather data and um, the fact that weather data was recovered from the Wonderground website and the data was taken from a weather station situated in nearby coastal town of Inverkip. Okay. I wouldn't really call Inverkip a nearby coastal town. Um, there are plenty of other coastal towns closer to the south of Butte than Inverkip. Um, and it, I don't think it would have been uh, too much hassle for a, a thorough hydrographic survey or a thorough survey of any sort to have set up a small weather station uh, to gather more precise weather data. And why is this important? It's extremely important because if we think back to the very beginning, prevailing westerly winds are one of the characteristics of the south of Butte. And according to Noah, they influence ocean currents, as do tides, etc. So we, um, we end up at this scenario where we're relying upon the weather station at Inverkip, which is 12 point, nearly 13 miles away from the target site across the Firth of Clyde. And to me, that really raises questions about the accuracy of any data that came, that, that, that would impact the target site. It takes absolutely no account for uh, the variability of conditions or variables such as wind, tide, currents, undercurrents, etc., which may influence the disbursement of these harmful chemicals throughout the immediate coastal environment of the south of the island of Butte. Because it's like me saying um, that the, the weather in Erskine is going to be the same as it is in Dunlop. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. There, there is no way that you would take that as a proxy for an accurate weather prediction. It just wouldn't be done in a peer-reviewed, um, well-informed survey. It just wouldn't be done. And also, it doesn't take any into any consideration the concept of a microclimate. Um, here, we're stating that climate is statistical which implies that spatial and temporal variation of the mean values 
of the describing parameters within a region, there can occur and persist over time sets of statistically distinct conditions. And these sets of statistically distinct conditions are exactly what happen in the island, the south of the island of Butte, where it can be raining on the mainland and it's not raining in Butte. It can be raining, it can not be raining um, in another place and it can be raining in Butte. It can be there can be a high degree of wind in the south of the island and high tidal currents, and they might not be present elsewhere in and around the Firther Clyde. The the hydrograph the hydrography hydrographic survey takes into none of this into account, and this is well understood. There is nothing that's particularly um, complex about the un the basic understandings of these fundamental parts, really, of of earth and environmental science. There's not much that's 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 too complex here. These are really basic things that would be expected. To be considered when we when we think about um, uh, environmental assessment. So moving forward, we end up with a dispersion model dispersion modelling uh, portion of this application. Dispersion modelling. Uh, there's a report here for dispersion modelling, and I'm going to point you uh, at point uh, at pages six. We'll start at page six. So in six here. It states that uh, the feed scenario, so remember the feed containing levels of uh, um, various chemicals, okay? Uh, the, the model input is driven by release duration of one hour per day. And I would question that model input. I don't think, I don't believe that's an accurate input. I would really, and, and, and if you get, the old saying is, you get crap in, you get crap out. These parameters that we put into predictive models need to be well assessed, well understood. And I don't think that this one has been. There's no justification as to why we've picked one hour per day there. Okay, dispersion modelling, page number seven. Um, looking at the... Uh, the wind scenario is here as well. Um, the what we're seeing here is that the wind scenarios are based upon um, this is quite incredible actually are based upon data taken from Glasgow Airport okay so where is that mentioned the year long scenarios okay for wind wind scenarios and year-long scenarios, predictive scenarios for dispersion modelling. The year-long scenarios were all modelled with monthly varying wind data based on yearly averages for Glasgow Airport for the period November 2000 to May 2020. That, that Glasgow Airport is a significant distance away from the south of the island of Butte and it, it is not an accurate assumption that wind data for Glasgow Airport is going to be s reflective in terms of accuracy to the to the ma to the micro scale environmental conditions experienced off of the southwest so the south east coast of the island. It's just not representative of the conditions. I just wanted to point that out. Page number 12 here. In page number 12, what we're seeing here is uh, the South of Butte um, deposited material, feed and faeces. And essentially what we're seeing here are predictive models for disbursement where the dark blue indicates um, deposit a low concentration of deposited material with the proposed pods or the pens where the hawk's nib would be somewhere round about here. The proposed pens are you know adjacent to that and you can see that there are high concentrations of the faeces, faecal matter and um, 
and they feed right in the pens or the pods and that, that it eventually just disperses through the the water column. Um, interestingly here though, there is an absence in the data because the data or the model, there's a shortcoming in the model because the model does not project data for disbursement of particulate right into the coastline. And it's ine utterly inevitable that some matter will eventually make it right into the coastline. We've only seen a tiny bit of this that's making it into the coastline. These large lines are a shortcoming in the model as well. They, are, they, they indicate that the model was unable to accurately essentially predict where the particulates should be, and this is consistent in these graphics. That was one thing I wanted to show. We'll go on to page number 13, and it essentially states that um, that wind doesn't affect the model that they have. They, they executed a prediction uh, including wind and not including wind, and they're stating that the there would be no difference in the dispersion of particulate if there was wind or if there was not wind. And I just find that extremely hard to believe, to be quite honest with you. I find it extremely hard to believe. They're just stating it's as a black box and we gave it these input parameters and it told us this and we're not going to try and explain why with the presence or the absence of wind, things are the exact same. That indicates to me that the introduction of a variable, a biogeo physical variable doesn't affect to any degree the disbursement of particulate through the water column is extremely far-fetched. It's not, it doesn't align with, um, I think, basic understanding of the impact of, of something like wind on the water column due to currents as uh, is a, is a start. So, um, what we are looking at here, this is quite nitty, but um, subsection 3.2.3 .3 on page 15, let's just read this sentence or this paragraph. Figure 3.9 shows the predicted deposited mass of feed and feces at Butte after 390 days, end of model run, down to the 0 0.05 kilograms per meter squared contour. He deposits, there's a spelling error there, he deposits are predicted to have a maximum mass of approximately 0 0.06 kilograms per meter squared. The deposited mass decreases rapidly from the cages, spelling error from the cages, with contours greater than 0 0.05 extending south from the cage locations. The mean mass of the deposited material is predicted to be reach a mass of approximately 0 0.35 kilograms per meter squared. Let me read that again. The mean mass of a deposited material is predicted to be reach a mass of approximately. This is just littered with um, uh, sentence uh, irregularities, to be quite honest with you. I am extremely uh, surprised that something as important to the marine environment uh, like this is supported by a report which struggles to, to put together um, sentences into a comprehensive paragraph. It makes reading this extremely difficult, challenging, and quite confusing at times. Um, I don't know how much money they paid for this, but I think they could have probably produced something with a bit more um, integrity. So finally, um, we'll look at the bathing treatments uh, portion of this report within dispersion, uh, the dispersion modelling. Uh, we, uh, to do that, you need to look at, uh, you need to navigate to page 41 uh, of 58. So we'll, we'll head to page 41. This is what confused me most of all. So we're looking at south of Butte for the uh, known uh, uh, chemical compound uh, as methyphos, which was mentioned within the non-technical summary right at the very beginning. And this is meant to be a, disperse, a dispersion model which predicts where, if dumped into the ocean to treat sea lice for this bathing exercise, um, where this stuff would actually go. So you can see here in June 2018, this is a prediction, okay? Uh, it's a simulation that it would all be put here. 
uh, and the red denotes a high concentration and the you know blues indicate not quite as high well a lower concentration okay but the the chemical compound this is the hox nib here and then glencallum bay down here and this would be uh, i believe greater cumbria here basically the the entire from 7th of june at 12 30 in the afternoon to 6 30 in the afternoon the entire plume moves up okay the first north east okay and begins then to disperse into the great cumbria okay and you can see here that we're now 8th of June later on and it seems to have, for all intents and purposes, beginning to pull out the top of the, or the north of the island of Cumbria. Um, there's no, there's absolutely no commentary within the report to explain any of this that I can see. And this goes on page after page after page. You can see here that the plume, there's a plume here off the fish farm. There's a huge, dense plume off the North Island of Cumbria. And there's now particulates which have dispersed into the mainland and onto the mainland. They're now all over the mainland. They're on the mainland. They're all the way up the mainland. Almost as, I mean, they were talking about Inverkip earlier on. They're almost up at Inverkip. They're up away up at Guruk by that stage. And there's just page after page of these very confusing diagrams which are not documented. There's no commentary to to provide any kind of... Uh, there's no narrative here. There's absolutely no narrative. So from here on, in the report, we've got page after page of which appears to be projected disbursement scenarios over dates, a date and time range, or dates and time ranges, which eventually mean indicate here, for the best of intents and purposes, that Cumbria becomes polluted, and so does the mainland. This is quite incredible. This is the cypermethrin, which is the cancerogenic, which again is released in doses here for the bathing activity, which floats not northeast again, settles on Cumbria, and then ends up on the mainland. And there's there's special sites of scientific interest in this part of the Firth of Clyde. I mean, th this is really quite a confusing report. I mean, it's a fifty-eight page report, and I've read it multiple times, and I'm kind of struggling to to see whether this is, this doesn't help to me the, the this application whatsoever. These uh, disbursement models are challenging and raise a lot of questions about, I think, the uncontrolled nature of the p potential spread of these particulates within the Firth of Clyde. Um, because this, now, what this means is that the potential marine environment which has been affected is not merely limited to the, the initial application site we're talk this indicates that there's a potential a serious potential for these particulates to affect the marine environment far in excess of even butte we're not even talking about butte anymore anyway we get up to page 57 and the conclusions here are and i just want to read this the aim of the investigation point number two to what extent may the sites individually or in combination cause appreciable appreciable impacts in the wider marine environment this report fails in its entirety to address that aim the key aim number two which is to what extent may the sites individually or in combination cause appreciable impacts in the wider marine environment why because it, it barely mentions environment. That's why. It doesn't, it fails to meet the key aim. Finally, they've reduced the, um, they've reduced the summary 
for South Butte to one paragraph. Okay? Um, which quite honestly is is quite disgraceful that they've got 56 other pages of content and that they've reduced a, a summary of the South Butte disbursement modelling activity to one paragraph. Because this paragraph here, or the rest of the content here, continues to talk about largs and the site of scientific interest there, and uh, Cumbri, uh, Little Cumbri, Big Cumbri. It doesn't, um, it does not uh, cover enough about what the actual impact relative to the questions which have been posed. The aims that have been posed are not addressed within this one one paragraph summary it's 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 inadequate at, at best so moving forward now we're into the bath treatments and medicine modeling okay um which is really the last part of of this analysis that i undertook and the bath treatments and medicine modeling report which again is available um within the sepa uh, application page you know you just click bath medicine modeling and you end up um, here. Uh, the issue I've got with this is on page four. This is a very short report, it's only nine pages long. And the issue I've got with this is on page four. On page four, I've highlighted the issues here. The maximum permissible quantity of uh, as metifos that can be used in a three hour period was predicted to be 689 grams a treatment regime of two points two pens per three hour treatment and a net depth of three point zero eight meters. What this is essentially guiding or recommending is what dosage or what 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 is the permissible volume or weight of a methifos as as a methifos which can be dumped into the two pens every three hours at a particular depth of pen. Okay? And what they state is that they've got a short-term recommendation and a long-term recommendation. It should be noted that apparently, according to PubChem, which I showed earlier on in the analysis, as Methifos was the, 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 the least harmful of these chemical compounds. For Cybermethrin and Delta Methrin, they don't even have a long-term, they didn't even undertake long-term modeling exercise here. So for the carcinogenic, a chemical compound, cypermethrin, which is also highly destructive, highly um, toxic to the marine environment, long-term environmental impact. And for delta methrin, which is long-term environmental impact, toxic for the marine environment as well, there's not even any long-term analysis which has been undertaken here, any long-term study, which is unacceptable. So I'm going to move on to the summary here. In short, uh, I've got five parts to my summary. One, investigation into the main pollutants raises serious blocking questions as to compliance with at least one Scottish statutory instrument, namely Schedule 1, the indicative list of main pollutants, which we looked at earlier on, where it mentioned in bullet point number four or in point four, the carcinogens, of the Water Environment Controlled Activities Scotland Regulations 2011. Okay, Scottish statutory instrument mentions carcinogens um, should not be entering essentially the marine ecosystem. Point two, this application and the accompanying application for the Great Cumbria and Little Cumbria lack any information pertaining to environmental impact assessment. There is utterly, there is literally zero assessment of environmental impact in terms of animal wildlife or contaminant of marine floor, or anything like this. This does not meet the public expectations or legal statutory regulatory compliance required for applications which may have severe detrimental impact and long-term detrimental impact to Scotland's marine environment. The hydrographic survey states that it was undertaken within, the hydrographic survey stated that it was undertaken within the, the Greater Cumbria geolocation, meaning that it's of absolutely no use for the South Butte application. 
This entire survey there should be withdrawn, as it raises numeral, numerous questions and concerns relating to the technical and quality assurance competency of the people, people or persons responsible for producing the report. That is a basic, if it's a basic error, th that report should never have been paid for in the first place. If it's not a basic error, then it should be withdrawn immediately. The dispersion modelling, number four, the dispersion modelling document fails to meet one of its key aims, namely, to what extent may the sites individually or in combination cause appreciable impacts on the wider and marine environment? It doesn't even meet its second key aim. The numerous anomalies outlined in the analysis which are provided in this presentation raise serious concerns over the true accuracy and detail of the study. This does not instill confidence in the readers. Ultimately, this falls short of the document's ability to provide usefully and meaningfully to this application. A one-paragraph conclusion which fails to address the key study aims of the South Butte application is simply not comprehensive enough. It doesn't cut the mustard. Point number five of the summary here. The bath medicine or treatments modelling document fails to provide long-term recommendations or guidance on the permissible dispersible quantities of polluting, potentially carcinogenic chemicals, some of which are known to be highly toxic to the marine environment. Again, this is simply not comprehensive enough. It's unbecoming of accompanying um, academically or research-oriented, research-based material where specifications or instruments are provided. Um, there's a theme throughout. The specifications for instruments are provided, techniques are, 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 are uh, described, etc. But the substance of the research activity seems to be lacking. And there, there's no difference with the bath medicine or treatments modelling document. There's no long-term strategy um, for the permissible um, amounts of the carcinogenic, harmfully, long-term, detrimentally toxic chemical compounds which should be released into the marine environment, and it's just not good enough. As a final note, um, Nature Scotland, which is Scotland's nature agency, has uh, highlighted that otters, sea otters, are a uh, protected species. Very interesting. And in particular, it's an offence um, to disturb an otter in a manner, to, a manner or circumstances likely to significantly affect the local distribution, or disturb an otter in a manner or, a manner or circumstance likely to impair its ability to survive, breed, or reproduce, or rear, or otherwise care for its young. I've heard stories from the island that sea otters are uh, returning um, to the island. Have been some few have been spotted in recent times, and uh, I think that the last thing that they would need is potential carcinogens, chem carcinogenic chemicals, regardless of what quantity um, they're being dumped into the ocean at, and being dumped into the med immediate vicinity in which they are trying to breed, survive, reproduce or rear or otherwise care for young. It's just not a responsible um, environmental situation to create. Um, the conserv this is the, the protected species here. Um, as a European protected species, the otter is a European protected species. The otter is fully protected under the Conservation Natural Habitats Regulations 1994. And I pulled these up in legislation.gov as well. These are UK statutory instruments. So not Scottish statutory instruments, but UK statutory instruments. Um, and you can look that up as well, um, if you wish to look more into the the um, the instrument itself. But I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your patience and, and uh, hearing this information. I hope uh, I've d brought some, um, some more information to the uh, South Butte Controlled Activities Regulations consultation currently undergoing, uh, uh, underway and under review at SEPA. If you're interested in having a look at this, you can log on to the SEPA website or you can just navigate to consultation.sepa.org.uk and you'll see the Donfresh South Butte Car Consultation. It's open until the 31st of May 2021. Uh, you can have a look at all the information that I gathered this from and you can therefore go and have your say and you can go ahead and um, enter your data into the consultation survey if you've got any feedback i'll be doing the exact same for the time being thank you